please give a warm welcome to John Waterston. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to say they saved the best for last, but really they brought Ocean of Things out to San Diego because this is the site that's on the edge of the largest ocean in the world. And Ocean of Things has been out in the Pacific, and I'm going to love to tell you about this program, what we've been doing kind of over the last three years. The H1, right, the Hellmeyer question of what we're trying to do is understand the ocean environment. The ocean is 70% of the Earth's surface, yet it's an extremely complex environment. As we heard uh, presenters yesterday talk about, it's woefully undersampled. It's understood only by models, and it does not have that human interaction that goes with it day in and day out. You're able to get these great views of this, but still, even with the advance of ocean modeling and prediction that we see today, it is greatly at a low resolution. This is about one-tenth of a degree resolution, or about 10 kilometer grid. We see that that does not allow to account for the uncertainty that exists in the operational environment. So for the Navy, for fisheries, for environmental understanding, we need to do a better job of figuring out what is going on at the surface of the ocean. And I want to do it in a different way. So the way it's done today is we put sailors on aircraft carriers. They read your backyard weather equipment. They look at the temperature, the wind speed, the humidity, the dew point, those types of things. And they're being driven around by a nuclear reactor and 5,000 other sailors, aviators. And we have a sample of one point on the globe. Well, Noah said that's probably not the best way to do it. We want to figure out a way that should be persistent, that stay out there, monitor our EEZ, work with our partners around the globe. So the National Data Buoy Center has populated multiple sites around the world, hundreds of sites, with these types of buoys. They're connected to the internet, and they make many of those same types of observations. A little further along in the observation, we wanted to understand what was going on underneath the ocean. So the Argo float system uh, was kind of invented here at Scripps. I actually got to meet with them as I was coming up with Ocean of Things. These floats go out. They submerge to 1,000 meters, stay down at that depth for about a week, and they measure the temperature of the ocean from the surface down to 1,000 meters. A week later, they pop up and they transmit what they, they learned at depth with that temperature profile going down and back up. But still at $20,000, there's only 4,000 of these floats in the ocean today in their five-year lifetime. So we created Ocean of Things. We needed to create a sensor platform that was based on many of the findings that we're getting from our cell phones, their low-power batteries, their ubiquitous communications, their high-speed processors, all of those investments were now driving a new paradigm for ocean sensing. So the park drifter that we have here was a, uh, made for this program, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about the many features that it has. So as you can see, it's a hybrid system. It has a rechargeable battery on the inside and has a set of solar panels on the top, this way that it can persist for a long time in the ocean environment. We designed it to live for approximately one year, um, and we have sensors out there today that are still alive. It's connected back to the world via satellite communications, and then it has uh, sensors like your cell phone. So we call these the hotel sensors, everything from GPS, measuring its position, its velocity, to uh, Temperature probes on the bottom and at the air temperature measures humidity, pressure, wave spectra with an accelerometer. And then we have a set of mission sensors, things that are like this, this uh, bi-directional camera. So two cameras mounted back to back, each with 170 degrees of field of view. So now it's taking cell phone images, you know, cell phone camera images um, periodically at the surface. And then we are also listening to the RF spectrum, measuring things like AIS, VHF bridge-to-bridge -bridge radio. Other types of mission sensors we've included are hydrophones and software-defined radios to allow increased flexibility. And then when you take the whole fleet of Ocean of Things sensors together, you now have this comprehensive sensing platform. So 
So the other thing that you get here is not just the suite of sensors that we've put on these distributed drifters. You have a microprocessor. In this, in this float, it's equivalent to a Raspberry Pi. So there's a microcontroller running, like an Arduino microcontroller, but that's also coupled to a Snapdragon or some other uh, you know, small Linux embedded computer that's able to do advanced processing. So not only just recording the data, it's now identifying anomalies in those data and reporting those differences out. It's compressing that, that raw data finding anomalies, and we're even running advanced um, convolutional neural nets that have been trained ashore and then delivered to these floats so that with those cell phone pictures that we're taking, it will identify if there are ships, if there are aircraft, or if there are people in any of those images. Then it will rubber band those, downsample them, and then communicate them off. This is an example of the image that was taken uh, from, from the float that we got ashore. So the far right-hand side of the image is after this image compression. So we have to reduce the size of these images by 10,000 times. So we downsample the RGB color into a black and white. We do a lot of image compression. But at the high-resolution camera, you know, multiple megapixel scenario, we're able to run that through the convolutional neural net. This was a great example off of California here where a vessel traversed right by an Ocean of Things float and we were able to capture this image and we knew afterwards we could figure out what that vessel was and understand the activity in the ocean environment. In the center, we're showing how we validated in some of these outdoor wave tanks across the nation some of the interesting um, parameters and sensor performance that we've seen. Obviously, everyone knows about low Earth orbit uh, satellites and the ubiquity of communications today. This is only going to improve. Uh, currently, we're using an Iridium small burst data. So every 20 minutes, we get 340 bytes from every one of these distributed floating sensors. So this is uh, what our field looked like in the Atlantic on the 14th of May this year. Uh, at the end of March, we deployed 1,500 floats off the Chesapeake Bay. And about two months later, it had propagated into that wide area, about the size of that rectangle that you see on the left. All the yellow and red dots in the left-hand pane are those NOAA floats that I talked about in the previous thing. So for probably a tenth of the investment now, we're covering this area at a much greater spatial and sensor diversity and time resolution than has ever been done before. And this allows us to create see, uh, new types of insights and share this data with academics, uh, commercial uh, observations, and then to be a resource for future modeling. So this is being published on the web today. You can go to oceanofthings.darpa.mil and get this link back to the NOAA ERDAP site, which is part of the International Ocean Observing System. And all sorts of sensors across the ocean feed back through NOAA and are published and, and stored there for ongoing research. So these are the types of things that you can see. This is back in April when Ocean of Things was really existing in that stream flow of the, uh, the Gulf Stream. So you can see we deployed it off the Chesapeake into the Gulf Stream, and the floats mostly progressed uh, in that kind of river that exists in the ocean across the East Coast. What you're seeing represented in color is the pressure, pressure sensor. And so if you watch carefully, you can see things like low pressure zones move across the field. Here, we're gonna restart that again. Now we're back in April. You can see low pressure moving across, and then you can also see the pressure differential created by these temperature variants on the cold northern edge of the Gulf Stream versus the warm Sargasso Sea south of the Gulf Stream. And now you see these large aggregate processes that are being recorded in real time. Similar to these type of environmental insights, you get operational insights. So earlier in February, we put 1,500 floats in the Gulf of Mexico. They started operating, and every one of those gray dots you see in the Gulf of Mexico is one of the AIS reports that it has, uh, these floats have identified. You'll now start to see the deployment occur out of the Chesapeake Bay, and the floats starting to make their AIS reports. The green dots are AIS reports tied to a specific emitter, an IEMEI -E that's assigned to a specific vessel. 
This vessel is transiting out of Houston and going to Europe and then coming back through Europe, from Europe, back into Houston. And so we're able to track this one vessel through the field on eight discrete transits through Ocean of Things, both in the Gulf of Mexico and in the wide open North Atlantic, where we don't have AIS receivers there today. So hopefully you understand that this is just one ship out of those thousands of reports that you're seeing. We have received over 100 million reports from Ocean of Things sensors, and the data is available, and I look forward to all the wonderful things that you will be able to do with this data. I will be over there. You can go play with the Ocean of Things float uh, in the next break, and look forward to hearing all your great ideas and figuring out ways to advance this type of research going forward. Thank you very much.